keyboard to the boardroom. This is the business of esports. As the prophet of esports, I rely on trustworthy and meaningful data every day. Data from our research partner, YouGov, offers the most complete view of esports fans and gamers in the world, providing context to who they are, what they think, the brands they buy, and things they do. YouGov's connected insights and research services inform strategy at every level. If you're a team, a brand, agency, or rights holder, you should be talking with YouGov. Their partners measure and maximize ROI and are telling compelling stories with data. Visit yougov.com slash gaming dash esports to learn more. From the keyboard to the boardroom, this is the Business of Esports weekly news show slash post podcast live stream. I am Paul the Prophet Dawalibi. I'm joined today by my friends and co-hosts, the Honorable Judge Jimmy Barada, Jeff the Juice Cohen, for those of you who are new here, welcome. What we do here is we cover the most pressing gaming and esports topics and news of the week, but we look at all of it through a business and C-suite lens. We dissect, we analyze the business implications of everything happening in this industry. But best of all, uh, with the live show, we get to do it live with you guys. We get to participate, ask questions, get in our faces, um, challenge us. We encourage you to get involved. It makes it that much more fun. You can lurk if you want to. We know so many of you do. But we really, really appreciate if you get involved. Bring your friends, bring your family, bring your colleagues. Make it a make it a Wednesday night event to be here um, and participate. Welcome everybody, Jimmy, Jeff. How are you guys doing this week? I want to know how you're doing, Paul. This is like a marathon recording day for us now. We have so much content coming out, you guys. We got the live show right now, the podcast, special episodes. Meta business, meta woman, office hours. It's it's nuts what's going it's on. A building, I, I, you're building a media company. <laughs> Who would this have, is what you're supposed thought. to do. Who would have thought? Um, yeah, what's the special it's, episode. Can you tease that? I t I teased is it, it last week. Or is it the lawyer? Yeah, it's the legal oh, awesome. special legal episode. Um, we, we recorded it today, so you guys have that to look forward to very soon. It'll come out probably in the next week or so. Um, and, uh, it was a really fun episode. We touched on, I will tease, uh, loot boxes. Obviously we touched on some M and a like mergers and acquisitions. We touched on contract stuff, uh, like player contracts, corporate contracts, like supplier contracts, uh, and tied everything back to obviously relevant news stories, uh, but also learnings, takeaways, um, call it free legal advice that uh, you can only get on the business of esports and uh, provided by one of the very best law firms specialized in the esports space, Segev LLP, who are our, um, our partners in that episode. So a um, lot, lot, lots to look forward to, guys. Well, not, not, and not just that, you know, I mean, Paul has been recording, guys, for like six hours straight today. <laughs> that, that's the way I asked the question. Because uh, I also want to tease the podcast, right, Paul? Like we had a great guest uh, I, I mean, we just had a great episode and don't let me take the words out of your mouth if you want to introduce. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, we, we no, absolutely. So you can go ahead, Jimmy, but like well, Samsung next guys we had on, on is who you have to expect on the podcast this week. Yeah. Uh, so it's the investment arm of Samsung sort of looking at all the futuristic stuff. Uh, and we had Brandon, uh, Hoffman. Brandon Hoffman, uh, who's like their web three guy, their gaming guy, their, you know, metaverse guy. And real quick, they have investments in Board Ape Yacht, Board Ape Yacht Club in the Sandbox. I mean, any innovative uh, company that overlaps with Samsung proper, they're taking a look at. They're they're making bets, and it's it's a great episode for anyone that wants a broader, I think, picture of the metaverse and on how companies like Samsung are getting involved. A lot of overlap, I thought, with Meta Business and some of our programming there. But obviously, everything has roots in gaming, so we were proud to have them on Business of Esports. That should go live within the next few days. Yeah, and I'll just tease one last thing, guys. Um, 
new coming from our friends at YouGov is once a month, we're going to have, uh, if you guys remember the YouGov Insights segments uh, that everyone loved so much, we will probably be having one person from YouGov come on the show once a month uh, to guide us through, call it a YouGov Insights segment, answer some of the juices, tough questions, obviously, uh, and dig into... Uh, dig into the great data that you yeah. provides. provide. So they don't know what that they signed up for. I mean, the juice <laughs> is not going to hold back. <laughs> uh, but you, you can expect that on the live stream. So they'll be with us That'll live awesome. once a month. That'll be awesome. Uh, which will be fun. Uh, Johan says, hi everyone. Johan, welcome. Great to see you back. Adam says, happy Wednesday, Adam. Great. Always great to see you. Um, happy Wednesday, everyone. Guys, we have so much to talk about. Yes. We're missing Lindsay again this week. I know. It's not the same without her, um, but we'll soldier on and uh, and try and make a great show out of this. Um, we do all miss her, and I've got so many comments from people last week asking, where was Lindsay? Um, and uh, that's a good question. Where is Lindsay? On vacation somewhere. Uh, <laughs> oh, one last thing that I mentioned on the podcast. Jimmy, you're muted. It's it's for the best. I realize I was uh, giving away her her location, and she might not want us to know. Avoid all the fans, you know, when, when she's traveling. But uh, somewhere in the UK, I'll say I'll, I'll keep it a little more broader. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did want to tease uh, the business of esports. Everyone you see on this screen here and more, uh, we are going to be doing a very special panel at PAX East. If you have any plans of being at PAX East. Um, Now's now you have a reason to go. I would argue before you had no good reason to go to PAX East, but now that you know the prophet himself is going to be there in the flesh, I mean this is a religious experience. If you've never if you've never had it, um, you want to make it and you want to come see our business of esports live panel. We're going to have industry people. You're going to have the juice. You're going to have Jimmy. We're all going to be there. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun at PAX East, which is uh, April, I want to say, 21st to the 24th. Correct. Um, so end of April in Boston, one of the best gaming shows you can go to, obviously, guys. Uh, and uh, the most fun part will be our panel um, on Friday. I think it's on the Friday. So Correct. go check that out and make sure to come say hello to us if you're going to be at PAX East. I'm obviously going to remind you as we get closer, but I wanted to... Um, to tease it because we're all going to be there. So Tom says, I want to go now. That sounds great. Tom, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I hope we'll see you there. Um, we've done, the Business of Esports has done two other live shows, three other live shows at PAX in the past. Obviously, there was no PAX East last year. So it'll be fun. Uh, it'll be fun to go this year. Mrs. DeVos says, I wish I could go. I wish that too. I wish everyone could come uh, check it out and uh and come to our panel so that's what everyone has to look forward to coming up all right let's jump into some stories guys i think i've chit chatted enough here i think i've introed enough right i've plugged enough go subscribe to the meta business podcast guys um jeff and i put in a lot of work every single week and it's a really good show and uh i i hope everyone uh, agrees and enjoys it so go go subscribe to that on spotify or apple podcasts or anywhere you get your podcasts okay guys let's jump into some news we've got business of esports news i want to start with maybe the most uh important story um this week it was a report from hp definitely the most important story this week this is not a joke at all um and the headline here, nine out of 10 believe PC gaming offers better experience <laughs> compared to mobile. <laughs> and, so and this one was, out of 10 have never played games. Yeah, yeah. Is, yeah who's the one guy? <laughs> who's the one guy? HP India's Gaming Landscape Report 2021 shows that nine in 10 gamers believe that a PC offers a better gaming experience than a smartphone, and many are keen to reportedly migrate to PC gaming. I'll do, I wish I could drop this mic. I can't. It's on a very fancy stand um, and call it a day. There we go. We have scientific evidence that I've been right all along. Now, I mean, I'm obviously starting with kind of a silly story, guys, but did anyone need this report? And first of all, second of all, um, 
Is anyone surprised that the report mentions, it's, I'll, I'll highlight it here, it says, the report mentions that 37% of mobile gamers want to shift to a PC for a better gaming experience, and 54% believe PC gaming has better graphics, technology, and processing speed than a smartphone. Um, does I mean, that not, second, do those numbers not seem low to you? Well, yeah, so I was say, the, second, the second one makes me think that maybe there's something wrong with these people or that they're <laughs> the servant. Because it's like, now keep in mind, it's India, it's a HP yeah. India where mobile yeah. is much more prevalent, right? And yeah. disposable income's lower, and you know, there's all kinds of, but it other just seems factors. like the an obvious, like PC gaming, clearly the graphics and technology and processing speeds are better. Like, that's like saying, like, the number three is greater than the number one. Yeah, like, right. It should be a fact. The, the, right. the part about gamers wanting to shift from mobile to PC is much more interesting and, and kind of the heart of where I think it's more of the, the profit is right take. Although 37% is like not um, even a majority. So I don't even know. It's not, if, you know, that's <laughs> yeah. not even it's that not, it's not the most convincing statistic. But, yeah. <laughs> that, that's where the methodology comes into play, right? Like how did they ask this question? How did they compile this data? Because preference, like you said, Jeff, is different than just something that's factual, like it's factual that PC is better. You can't really dispute that. But if they prefer mobile, or maybe not all of them have significantly or, or played enough time on, on PC, that's a different thing altogether. So that's why I question the methodology and why we're so lucky to have YouGov as partners of the show that will be coming on presenting data like this and, and helping us. Um, you know, th this is a fun story. Like you said, Jeff, the profit is right kind of thing. But uh, some <laughs> of the other ones will be able to dive, I think, into the nuts and bolts of it and, and really extrapolate some true meaning. Uh, Tom says, come to Southern California. Tom, that's why I have Jimmy, right? Jimmy's already there. He's the, 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 it's already been done. Um, let's move on, guys. I, I, I want to get to a more serious story. And this one, I think may cause a lot of debate, maybe not. I actually am not sure. I want to kind of throw it up there and see. Um, and, but the headline definitely is clickbaity. It says, uh, this is a PC gamer story, Netflix of games isn't likely, says analyst. So this is research firm Ampere. It says they're not convinced that subscription services like Game Pass are taking over gaming. Uh, <laughs> they did a talk at GDC, which, uh, by the way, Jimmy uh, was at. And... Um, and what they mentioned was, according to, to Ampere analysis, subscriptions currently account for 4% of the total games market. He forecasts it'll be 8.4% by 2027, a significant amount of money, but still a small slice of gaming as a whole. He also points out that the total number of Game Pass games is fairly small, hasn't been growing much. It's about a 500 games under Game Pass. And... Um, and that it's not like Netflix started small too and has over 2 million, 200 million subscribers, he says. But he points out that games and videos are different from each other in some important ways. Uh, according to Ampere's data, 79% of game spending in 2021 came from in-game transactions in free-to-play and paid games. That kind of behavior doesn't exist for Netflix or Spotify. So the crux of his argument, game passes and Netflix for game style services are not going to be very big. They will remain sort of niche. And he doesn't think that games are on a verge of a Netflix-like takeover. He's quoted as saying, I don't believe that subscriptions will become the dominant monetization model in the game sector as it has done progressively in the video and music sectors. Anyone agree with his take? And do any of you guys agree with his take? I, I, I disagree. I, sorry, Jimmy, go ahead. Go, go to, you can go to Jeff no, if no, you want to. I just thought if anyone forward. was going to agree, I thought maybe Jeff would, mm. would, would. No, I think, let's put this, I think six months ago, I probably would have agreed. And I've, uh, you know, as maybe you're alluding to, I've been super bearish on Netflix being the Netflix of games and, and kind of the moves they've made so far. But it, Game Pass, we can't ignore Game Pass. I mean, Microsoft has made, you know, two massive acquisitions, one obviously, you know, bigger than the other, but it, clearly Game Pass is why they bought Activision Blizzard. They're going to put those titles into Game Pass day one. So it's really hard to sit here and ignore that that exists. Like, I, I think, you know, plus we saw Sony just announced a, a big subscription. Now they didn't get right? into that. Yep. They yeah. didn't. Put, uh, I'm always good with the segues, the early segues, <laughs> I guess. The uh, They didn't put day their games in day one, but 
clearly they're moving towards a bit of a subscription model as well. So I don't know. I think this guy will probably end up being wrong. I also want to add to that because I, I agree that I think that this is uh, just wrong. Um, we covered around uh, October, November uh, last year, um, Microsoft CEO is it Satya Nadella, whose bonus, uh, who didn't hit his bonus because the Game Pass subscriptions fell short and there was a heavy component built into his contract about building out Game Pass. And we remember focusing on that point alone was this is the CEO of Microsoft proper and a heavy component of his year end bonus was on Game Pass. And yeah, it was short, but that, that just kind of indicated how much emphasis and effort they're putting behind it, as well as how confident they are in its future. So whether it's Netflix being becoming the Netflix of gaming, whether it's Microsoft, um, you know, hitting these projections uh, this year or whether it's Sony, uh, you know, turning some heads with their new subscription service. I, I, these are three very compelling arguments for why this this opinion is wrong. But do you, also, does no one buy the argument that if most of the revenue is coming from free to play microtransactions, right, that that as a percentage of the total revenue, Game Pass subscriptions, Game Pass style subscriptions will will be always relatively niche if free to play and in-game transactions are the majority of the dollars. Or do you believe that that's not a good argument because you think people who are doing free to play will eventually move over to Game Pass style subscriptions? It's a good question. I mean, I think, it's a little bit, it's a little bit of a cop out because it's in, a lot of the free to play is including mobile, so it's like it depends how we define the, the gaming industry, and obviously I think we're as guilty as anyone. I think I use the the definition that sort of suits suits best. So like I'm happy to talk about the two billion gamers out there that clearly includes mobile, but now I don't want to include mobile, so I'll kind of acknowledge that. The, the thing that I was going to say and something I was thinking of that I honestly never really thought of before until we just started this conversation that I want to get your take on. Do we think the metaverse, whatever that, whatever your definition of it, will it be a subscription? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, there, the, the obvious, the, I think the knee jerk reaction is, it's so much of it is going to be driven by in-game, like in metaverse cosmetic purchases that probably not, right? That sort of tends towards free to play or free to enter or however you want to describe it. Um, but it's a good question because it definitely could be a subscription, right? Yeah, like an I, I don't, I didn't think you had to limit your comment to everything other than mobile either, right? Like Apple Arcade is an all you can eat mobile game subscription. The question is how many people will move off of free to play or free to enter or what if you're talking about the metaverse, right? How many people will move from that to a subscription instead of buying cosmetics a la carte, right? How many people will see the value of some kind of all you can eat subscription? I do think the point that he that he probably is driving at, I'm sure it was mentioned in the article, is just around how consumption is different, right? You you can play games for many, many hours. Like the average gamer will maybe play, I don't know, four games a year. Obviously, some people will play 50, but even still, you know, the average person just consuming TV content will watch 250 shows a year. And like a power user might watch a thousand. So I, I do think like that is an inherent difference in the, the medium that that does not lend itself to subscription. Um but I just think people like Microsoft and Netflix, and when these these big companies get this business model in my head, in their head, I kind of think they're just going to like take a hammer to the industry and kind of mold it to the way they want it to be. Like I don't know, it just seems like that's where this is heading, and like there's no choice that we have. I don't know, maybe that's too simplistic. I, no, I, 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 these are all good points. I think another part of it relies on IP, like a lot of these free to play games are not really story rich environments. They're driven by microtransactions, by fun, short things that grab attention. Um, but there's always going to be a need, I think for that storytelling game, that captive RPG or what have you that, that people want to immerse themselves in. And I think, 
you know, whether it's a, a story, a story game or, or, or a game that has a nice strong story, but also has multiplayer, you know, we saw some great acquisitions at the start of this year and we saw a lot of backlash between amongst Microsoft and Sony, you know, when Bungie was acquired, when Activision Blizzard was acquired, like they better keep this game, you know, cross platform. Uh, and then when the Steam Deck stories came out, you know, Steam Deck saying, oh, we're not going to make our own subscription service, but we're welcome to support Microsoft on our platform. So one, you see a lot of, uh, we see a lot of consolidation. We see a lot of these development studios that are being acquired uh, that have interesting IP. And, and we see a lot of, and I don't know if that correlates or not to these Game Pass type efforts to these subscription services where they want to have a unique and tempting catalog to win the console wars, or at least to have an edge up over the competition. But part two is you see a, a big need also for, for that cross-platform play. How does that affect uh, subscription, subscription services? Well, depending on who you ask, if you ask, you know, Valve, right, they're, they're open they're, they don't want to compete they want to support it so i don't there, there's a lot of things to weigh and to consider here but regardless of where you land on any one of these issues i think it's still worth saying that there's significant money and effort being spent to develop these subscription programs mobile console pc uh and, and to expect it, it i would only expect it to grow and, and and for them to put more resources behind it um, I just want to read some of the comments here. Tom says, is it 4 to 8% of total gaming revenue? I wonder what the percentage is of total streaming revenue of all video entertainment revenue. Uh, Tom, it, it is of the, uh, they, they used revenue as sort of the, the way to, to, to come up with that number. So yes, um, uh, what it would be of the total streaming revenue of all video and entertainment, uh, that I don't know, uh, a smaller number I would assume uh, today. Uh, Johan says, why not in metaverse subscription in metaverse subscriptions to enter arenas, areas resembling real life gym memberships, et cetera? I mean, that would make sense, right? Um, and you, he goes on to say, think like the wow model in the metaverse. I mean, the wow model, let's be honest, no one has been able to replicate that, right? In all of gaming. And I would argue that that is the pinnacle of game monetization in the sense that they charge an upfront fee for the game and the expansions. They charge a monthly subscription to play the game and they charge for in-game items, right? You're like you want a little pet, you want to buy a wow token for more gold mm -hmm. in the game, whatever. Like it's all of the above. They just said, we want all the monetization. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I like, I would think everyone would want the wow model. Um, the question is what will people's reaction to that be? And, can you be undercut by free to play, right? Like this is always the challenge with free to play is, does it make your service seem expensive all of a sudden and people aren't willing to plunk down dollars to try? Um, well, well, the funny thing is even Fortnite has now a subscription model baked into it. You could play Fortnite free to play and that was one of the quintessential, I think, examples of a successful free to play game. And you can actually buy not not just the battle pass, right, which is just gamification uh, and rewards, but they actually have a subscription where it's like fifteen dollars a month. It comes with a new skin every month, as well as other rewards that you enable because you're part of this uh, this elite subscriber base. So it is that idea of attacking it on. It was I think I would Grand love Theft to see what that's announced. From them. I think GTA just announced the same thing, right? I don't know if we're gonna cover that, but seems like that's the premium subscription is now like something that a lot of these games are adding which makes all the sense in the world it's just like balance you know getting whatever servicing more of the demand curve if you will i like the idea of making it a vip experience but you have to have you have to offer enough to really justify the cost and there's you can a make it an NFT. War for all of it it's perfect <laughs> yeah. and i think tom's you should read tom's comment tom says i think mean, jeff is right about the hammer part the juice is often right uh, Johan says, I think it would make more sense to be a premium add-on rather than a standalone model. Yeah. I, totally. I mean, we have to get to a point where there are subscriptions that provide enough value in the metaverse, right? Like there are, there are hurdles before I think worrying about direct monetization and like being able to connect metaverses and, and interoperate between them and your avatar be able to travel between them and things like that. But yes. I, I agree as an add-on, it makes it makes a lot of sense. Because I, I wanted to put this story next to the Sony story, which um, Jeff, you, you ruined my my segue here. 
Um, but I wanted to see if this changed anyone's mind about that take, right? And the, the headline here, Sony to make gaming history next week, which they did. Um, this is this was the one the article published on Friday that I pulled. Um, next week with Breakthrough Business Plan. It says Sony will reportedly reveal its new Breakthrough PlayStation Spartacus subscription service next week and make games history. I feel like this author was a little bit too excited. Um, Why is in- this history? How, yeah, how is this not just copying what their betters have already done? It's a crappier version of Game Pass. Cool. So they're, they're going to bundle PlayStation Now with PlayStation Plus. It's going to be one offering. Uh, and here's, like, I'll put this up on the board. Here's sort of what, what you get. There's three tiers, $9.99, $12.99, and $15.99, which I think Game Pass is $9.99. I don't know if it's the same pricing. I think Game Pass has a wider range. Um, Jimmy or Jeff, if you want to check that quickly. Um, but um, that's what we have. Does anyone think Sony's is offering here is going to make much of a dent? I, it, I think it, it will. It depends what you mean by much of a dent. I think it Meaning will... like, are, are we going to be talking about it the same way we talk about Game Pass? Because yeah. I think Game Pass we've mentioned multiple times has been quite, I don't know, revolutionary is maybe too strong of a word, but uh, is really shaking up the games industry, I think, and will continue to and see explosive growth. PlayStation seems confused to me in the sense that, like the essential, I don't think other than the free monthly games, you don't get access to some library, right? I think you only get that with the extra subscription uh, and the premium. So, like it's not it doesn't feel like all you can eat game pass it feels sort of halfway between what they had now and game pass yeah i think this will be a decent piece of business for sony in the sense that i think a lot of people will look at this and say hey for three dollars more a month i'll get access to some old games like maybe i'll you play them once in a while like so i might as well just pay the extra three dollars so i think they'll they'll make a decent amount of incremental revenue and i'm sure that incremental revenue is very profitable but in terms of making a dent in the industry or this being literally something we ever talk about again i would say the only time we'll ever talk about this again is if they put start putting games you know day one into it and and raise the price which i suspect will happen in the next 18 months um otherwise we'll never talk about this again just nope. real quick uh real yeah, quick audit ahead. compare it with game pass i see game pass for console at 9.99 a month Game Pass for PC at $9.99 a month. Game Pass Ultimate, $14.99 a month. And it's worth noting that your first month is $1. Uh, also, I'm pretty sure I have a Discord Nitro reward of Game Pass for three months that I can gift or, or redeem myself, which is interesting because I thought Discord had a, a, an agreement with Sony after they kind of publicly shamed or embarrassed Microsoft on that $10 billion offer last year. So yeah, I, I yeah. just thought that was amusing. I, you know what I also hate about the Sony offering? Although I think, I don't know if Xbox still does it. At least they used to with gold or whatever. Like, why is online multiplayer a service I'm paying for as a console owner? Like, th- yeah. this is not, like, this is not 2001. Right? This, this it makes absolutely no sense to be listed as something that I'm paying for as part of the service offering. PlayStation's, like, services offerings, this is totally subjective this is me my own you know experience i find they've always been incredibly confusing i never have understood their service offerings i've never really understood what i get for it um you know i would argue nintendo also a little bit the same like i had you have to play for pay for online access or like online saves or things like that just features that you would think should be included uh, and that are included with a PC, right? If I buy a PC game, I can play it online. They're not, uh, the argument's the same, right? It's costing the developer server time. Um, I mean, you're making a, a, a broader rant that I'm happy to tack on to because this is part of the same argument, which is like, well, why am I paying $60 for this game when I used to pay that for the CD, right? For the disc, when they don't have distribution anymore. It's just an online purchase. So... I'm ranting because I think the PlayStation offering here is just marketed very stupidly, right? right? Like Game Pass, I think, has become dead simple. It's here are all the games you can play for $10 a month. 
that's not what PlayStation has gone and done here, right? It's like, here's some other things you get with it which should really be free. And and we're trying to mash together these already confusing offerings. Uh, it, 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 felt, it feels half-baked. It feels like a reaction to Microsoft and so, not so something that's well thought out. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I definitely agree with you. And, and my add-on was really to the point of it seems like a lot of these price points and a lot of the ways that they affect our culture or, the, or, or that the way they target uh, their consumer is just really outdated. And it's kind of a mesh of how things used to be done versus how they think it should be done. And it gets very confusing. We're kind of in need of a massive shift the way music underwent, where really, you know, out unit sales were, were replaced by streaming services. And you don't really monitor, measure, or care about individual album sales anymore. Um, I don't know how that works here if you just lean all in on Game Pass and PlayStation Plus. But what we did see in music was, again, this massive shift away from one economic structure and system that stopped working because of piracy and then re ended up relying on a, a broader access and subscription-based platform. Uh, and we haven't seen something similar, I don't think, in other mediums and in other industries, uh, which is why we have this confusion, why we have these price points that are kind of arbitrary why we have these marketing mechanisms that seem to not really address or or, or really give you the full picture or, or, or what we want so no i totally agree with you there i'm just trying to make sense of it and comparing to an outside industry yeah i always go back to like vcs talk a lot about this product market fit right and i think game pass has succeeded because they understand this and things like PlayStation Plus now, God knows what, like have not understood this. And things like uh, Google Stadia, right? Like if you understand who you're, the market you're going after is, and for these all you can eat subscriptions, for the most part, it's not the most hardcore gamer, right? Like it's really not. The most hardcore gamer already probably has a pretty significant library, plays the games they wanna play, probably plays one or two games a lot. Like, this is a more casual gamer, family, kids, right? Something that is meant to be simple, easy to understand. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to worry about my kid asking for the next, you know, a game that comes out. There's always stuff for them to play. And, and Xbox has succeeded at that, right? They even bundled it with the console for, like, one monthly price. It was, like, dead simple to understand. With PlayStation... None of this makes sense to me, right? Like, I, I'm confused by it. And if I'm confused by it, someone who's a more casual gamer is definitely going to be confused by it. And, and I suspect, like, Stadia, where you don't have that product market fit, it's going to miss the mark. Um, Matt said, it can be the next Game Pass, but I am one of the rare people that doesn't use Game Pass. Exclusives are what make PlayStation special. Give me more Spider-Man Spider -Man games or Ratchet & Clank. I have literally considered just upgrading to PS5 for the new Ratchet & Clank game. Matt, don't do that. Those games aren't that good. Um, <laughs> Matt says, join the Meta TV Discord. That I can get on board with. Discord.gg slash Meta TV. Uh, absolutely. Everyone should go join uh, the Meta TV Discord where we all hang out uh, and you can interact with all of us on a daily basis. Um, Tom says, I agree with Paul. Confusing. I have to Google the PlayStation subscription. I have to see which one it is when someone asks. Yeah, I never remember. Plus and now, like what what they what comes with them and what they all mean. I know I'm subscribed to one or both, but I don't even remember or know. Um, like it's at that level, so um, definitely doesn't 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 bode well. And I suspect you, it'll flop. Yeah. Did you guys see the comments? And I know this we're probably moving on, but I'm curious your thoughts. There was an article in um, forget GamesIndustry.biz where Jim Ryan had a quote, basically saying like. The reason why they're not putting PlayStation games, you know, day one into the subscription is because it would lower the quality of games. Uh, I guess I'm curious if you guys agree with that take. I don't think I do, but I mean, that was definitely not immediately, right? <laughs> they're going to put a bunch of games in the subscription that were made before the subscription existed. They're not just <laughs> magically going to go down in quality. That's a pretty dumb take. Yeah. Uh, I guess the argument would be we they would have to spend event to make the economics work they'd have to eventually spend less on development. I assume that that's that's the take. Mike, I well, don't, Microsoft I don't know clearly thinks that's not the case, right? Yeah. yeah, and and I suspect there is some there is some uh, I don't know what do you call it like a a balance point like a, a point 
at which that that intersection value, that intersecting value is where the kind of scale you need to get to in terms of number of subscribers so that you can continue to build the same quality of games. Now, do you need 50 million subscribers or 10 million subscribers? I don't know what the number is, right? Where you're sort of at the same level of revenue as what those games in their aggregate would have otherwise generated. Um, it's, I think it's an okay take. The reality is like, I, I don't think the developers are just going to make worse games. It's also um, not like a end all be all, right? Like the game pass subscription price isn't the only factor that pays for these games. Right. It's really to broaden their audience to get more people playing. And then you hit them also with the microtransactions in the games, which go back and pay for the games themselves. And, and the peripherals that Xbox is selling, right? The the racer, the sim rig, you know, the sim rigs and, and monitors or, or keyboard, everything, everything that these guys are selling goes into this giant mechanism. So you can't make the argument that if we have a game pass price, we put these games in that pool that we're gonna have to make games for cheaper. Because I, I think also you borrow, right? It's like some of the cheaper studios uh, where they're going to attract more users because it's in Game Pass. Uh, some of those cheaper studios are going to benefit off of being in there. And it's it, you're kind of spreading the losses around, but you're also cross-promoting or cross-pollinating, I think, among the different titles where you're getting people to try different games, to do microtransactions in those different games. I'm one of those where when I try a new game, more likely than not, I'm going to put 20 bucks or so because I'm going to want to look how I want to look. And I think they're kind of betting on that. I mean, even without the microtransactions, all we have to do is look at video streaming, right? Like Netflix itself or Hulu or Disney or any of these services, right? Like th did the quality of the content we watch go down? I would argue it's if anything, the quality up. of the content has gone up yeah. and I Although suspect it'll be the same because- There's still a lot of people that are saying that that whole ecosystem is unsustainable. Yeah, you know, none of them are really Because it, it, <laughs> it creates more competition and it forces the quality to go up, right? Because now, the value of the customer is not one game. The value of the customer becomes a lifetime value equation, right? That you have, you hopefully keep them for years and years and they're worth a lot more than just one game. And so to compete for customers becomes much more critical, right? And, and that competition creates good content and I think will create better games. Uh, I mean, their take is just wrong. I just don't think they've thought it through fully and I don't think they've looked at what has happened in entertainment broadly, uh, because that I, that's definitely not the outcome I see. Um, which is why you should be reading the business of esports.com and not game industry dot whatever. Um, I, I didn't say I agree, dot whatever. I, like, I thought it was a good um, discussion point. <laughs> you, want, you want actual takes I'm sorry. and correct. If I were the CEO uh, of Sony, come to the business of esports.com. <laughs> and we have a daily newsletter too. You don't even need to go to the website, have it pushed it. to your email every day. Uh, Super but it still simple. come to the website too. Just, but, uh, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, let this is from another outlet you shouldn't be reading um, because they don't have really no clue what they're talking about. Um, this the headline is Kappa Bar acquires Meltdown Bars, forms world's largest esports bar chain. Uh, the story here is uh, Swedish esports bar and restaurant franchise Kappa Bar that has acquired French esports bar chain Meltdown Bars. So they're now this bigger group. They they've become, according to them, the largest esports focused bar franchise in the world with 28 locations. I thought that was funny. That's not like that many locations. Um, and uh, they plan to open 100 venues by 2027. How do we all feel about esports bars, guys? And and sort of consolidation happening in the esports bar space. But before we dive too deeply into this, I want to tease, I'm pretty sure this was so discussed was. on this week's episode, Office Hours with the Professor you guys all know and love William Collis, been with us since the beginning. William's new spinoff show, Office Hours with the Professor, comes out once a week. One deep dive discussion, one topic William finds interesting. This is the topic for this week. So if you miss William, if you want to hear uh, you know, his voice and his perspective, uh, and if you're interested in esports bars, you know, uh, that should be pushed on this same feed for our podcast and audio listeners. And it's on our YouTube and on our website as well for everyone else. I'm sure nobody nobody misses William's voice. I mean, come on. 
great Stuart says, Williams. evening all, by the way. And Tom says, I heard the professor's rating and won't spoil it. I mean, we can talk about it, uh, Tom, if you'd like. And he I'm was, curious, he was foolish. Tom, did you agree with his rating or not? Let's put it that way. Jeff, go ahead. Uh, I want to see what Tom says. No, because I always agree with Tom. The, uh, the, I, I didn't, I don't know. I don't love this. Like, I, I guess, I just don't know if there's that much demand for this. Like, I, I'm much more bullish on, on kind of the land center model, and I'm not sure. Nothing that I saw, and at least when I listened to William's take, I didn't see any incorporation of that, like, either, you know, a land center aspect or, or just more gamification. I, I just saw it described as basically these are sports bars, but they're going to have esports on the TVs. Like, mm-hmm. for me, that's going to that's going to turn away more people than it's going to bring in, I think. Like, I, I just, I don't know, maybe I'm being too bearish, and I, obviously I work in this industry, so I, I shouldn't be, but I just don't know if there's that much demand, um, you know, to go to these things. I, I think the problem is, is there's no visuals here. I don't know what it looks like, and anything on paper can sound however the author and your imagination make it seem to sound. So, you know, like at Xset, we announced a partnership with Dre's nightclub in Vegas, kind of uh, an activation with a nightclub, you know, one step higher, I think, than a bar in terms of just like the rage factor, but also equally ambiguous as to like, what does that look like? Because I haven't shown you what the activation in the nightclub in Vegas looks like. Um, so when I think of these esports bars, and, and I'm sure if we go deeper into the story, and I'm sure William gets into this as well on his show, um, you can kind of illustrate, I think, what to expect, but without having, honestly, the deck in front of me where I'm seeing the architectural designs and layouts, the projections, it's a very hard thing um, because it does rely so much on imagination. And I've seen amazing creative firms that can take simple ideas like this and really bring it to life. Uh, that doesn't change, I think, Jeff's point, which comes next, which is, well, once you build it, will they come or will this kind of alienate and segregate communities as opposed to opening them up? What I can say on that front is my very first date with my fiance, I took her to one of those classic arcade bars. You know, they had all the pinball machines. They had all the old school, like 80s arcade machines, uh, Rampage and like the, the bartender one where you felt the glasses. And we had so much fun. Uh, and that was kind of like my nerd culture, my gaming culture, drinks, good food, and then kind of something that she wouldn't have gone with with any other guy, I hope. <laughs> but um, so to that same point here, do we get that same experience here, right, where it becomes a welcoming bar that open that's open to anyone that wants to drink and that kind of knows gaming's cool? Or is this really uh, just for people that like that kind of thing? You know, it's like the potential antithesis of an Irish bar, which is open to everybody that wants to drink because they know what to expect there, I think is it was, it was kind of to your point, Jeff. Look, I will, uh, Tom mentions it. So great inflation, A, but he was excited. I think he was on track. Yeah, you know, um, you should go watch the video, everyone. Like it's a great episode, uh, Office Hours with the Professor. It's he, like less than 10 minutes too, right, Paul? So, yeah, you know, quick, quick, quick Less video. than five yeah. minutes, in fact. Uh, he mentions three reasons why... Uh, including, you know, potential for content and that it could be relatively easy to scale, things like that. So I won't ruin the episode. You should go listen to uh, Office Hours with the Professor, but he, William does give some good reasons for why the merger makes sense. Um, the question I have for you guys is, do you like the idea of a an esports bar? And I'll define it as, you know, a place you can go drink, watch esports, uh, for the most part, right? Uh, that's maybe gaming themed, but targeted at a, an adult crowd because there's alcohol, right? Or would you rather have, at least in North America, because we, we should limit it in some way, or would you rather have a land center, right? Like a place you go to to yeah. play games and compete with your friends that is not age limited? The hard part about the bar part uh, as opposed to the land center is a lot of at least watching it a lot of why twitch is so successful is the connectivity that the audience has directly with who they're watching and maybe i'm taking this into content creators and less of esports which have the tournaments and the competitive element so correct me or redirect me if i'm broadening your hypo your your this hypothetical too much but right like if you're going to put on twitch and watch like a tournament 
that's one thing. If I'm going to, in that, in the random hours that the bar is open where there's nothing going on that weekend and I'm going to just leave Twitch on, well, there's no way for me in the bar to type in the chat to XQC or to whoever I'm watching. So it's a little different in terms of, I think, where that audience, why that audience normally watches and, and also how that content creator or, or that channel reacts with the audience. So personally, I'm more in favor of the land centers because I've been to some great land centers. We had Esports Arena on the podcast a few months ago based here in Orange County, but with dozens of locations around the United States, including inside multiple Walmarts. And I've been to their Wednesday night fight nights. They have a, a beer and liquor license. You know, you're, you're getting a drink and you're watching people play Smash Ultimate. You're watching Mortal Kombat um, and they're playing live there in front of you. Very fun environment, different experience. That's my preference. Yeah, keep in mind, the, the, I think the melt, most of the Meltdown locations have like things you can play, right? But they're more like console or social game or things like Smash, right? Where multiple people are gathered around. Maybe Francois can give us some details because I actually haven't been to a Meltdown. But oh, he cool. says there's one Meltdown in Montreal. It's where I always hang out usually. But it's more than just watching, right? So Would love not, to know more about it. But yeah. I'm curious what the chat thinks in terms of like... Would you rather own a pure land center open to all ages or do people like the idea of a more adult audience bar that's about the viewing and maybe more about social games and not so much hardcore gaming of any kind? So, so one thing about the viewing that I want to add from a business owner's perspective is when you have these land centers or when you allow anyone to play games, you need all that equipment, right? And, you know, I, for my bachelor party, which was uh, a few months ago, we went to a land center for part of the festivities and I got to speak with the owner and learn about uh, their location in Chicago. And this is mid lane esports, by the way, if you guys are listening outside Chicago, had the best time. My reviews are get, by the way, are getting thousands of views on Google maps. It's so funny. Um, <laughs> but I remember talking with them and them saying, you know, the, a lot of the problem is these kids and these players get so frustrated. They break the controllers or they break the equipment. And it's not a matter of being able to, or rather it's just a matter of being able to replace uh, because the kids will pay for whatever they break. You know, it's part of the terms, but it's just a matter of being able to find more and replace more. So I do like now, now that we're talking through this, that if you're a watching type of facility, that that concern, the need for certain high speed internet, the need for, you know, 20 or a hundred stations that can, uh, that you can hook a PC or a console or both to, a lot of these places really just have monitors with interchangeable parts. Um, you, you remove a ton of overhead and you kind of simplify the experience so that, you know, th there's pros and cons, I suppose, to both. Yeah. I think no doubt the capital cost to open a land center is, is definitely greater. I, obviously, yeah, that's what you just kind of touched on. I, but I do think if you open a land center and do it right, it's a lot easier to build a community and bring people in. I think if you open one of these bars, you have to then find the community find what they like, find what games they like. And you really have to probably build, you know, seven or eight different communities, right? Because if there's a League of Legends big tournament going on, it's probably not the same people you're going to bring in if there's, you know, a big FIFA tournament or, you know, a big NBA 2K tournament. It, it's just not. But they're so, coming for the drinking, right? So that's the draw that is somewhat yeah, but, universal. And like, look an at NBA 2K. comment. He says, imagine an Irish bar, but with gaming stuff. Yeah, but land centers can have bars. So I guess my point is, like, if I'm a big League of Legends fan and there's an NBA 2K tournament that weekend, like, I could care less about going to this bar. I'll, I'll just go to any bar, right? Yeah. Like, it's just, I don't know that it, you, I think it would be a lot harder than you would think. It, it, the premise of this kind of takes that gamers are very homogenous and that if you're a gamer, you want to go to a gamer bar because there'll be games on the TV. But frankly, like, if, if there's League of Legends, I might walk in and be like, this is terrible, I'm out of here. But if there's FIFA, I might be like, oh, well, this is cool, I'll stay. And I, I think that like most gamers fall somewhere in that spectrum. It's a good point. Here's, I think, where my take on this lies, though. And it's a, it's a subtle rebuttal of, of, your, of your take here, which is given the option, right, of going to a bar where I have no guarantee of finding any gamers... <laughs> Versus going to a bar where I find people who appreciate some games, maybe not the exact games I appreciate, I'd probably go, you know, probably go to a bar where I'll find some gamers, given the option, right? All other things being equal. And so I definitely see a market for this, and I, I like it. I think I like it better 
at least in North America, as a as a some like not instead of land centers, but call it for every land center, maybe two or three of these bars, because I think they do appeal to the kind of person who wants to go out that is into gaming, but may not go to a land center, right? Prefers people who go to a land center, it's because they want to play somewhere that's not their home with people who are not in their home, right? It's a very kind of specific outing Mm -hmm. versus a bar. You could just go two, three nights a week to drink and have fun with your friends. I don't, I don't recommend drinking at a bar three nights a week, but you know, (laughs) um, you could. And I, I think if you look at the land centers, that, at least that I'm aware of, almost all of them make way more money on food and beverage than they do on the land center itself. Right. And so throw in alcohol there, you know, probably uh, is more profitable and lower cost than a land center. Um, but outside of North America may, may be totally different, right? Maybe... I think the dynamics would be different, and I think it would, this would not be as interesting as a land center. Um, Stuart says, Paul, you've just described the gaming version of Tinder. <laughs> well, I see all kinds of opportunities for gamer dating, um, especially if you have gamer bars. I mean, that they should go I hand think, in hand. I think this is the second week in a row we've talked about gaming Tinder. Like, we might have to just start this. We like, might I'm have to just sure do this, it, yeah. I'm pretty sure we talked about this last week, too. Um, all right, guys, that um, before we get to the next section here, actually, I want to just read this comment. Francois says, you would be surprised, Jeff. The land centers have a harder time here than the thematic gaming bars. We have a couple. Um, so there you have it. Interesting anecdotal yeah, evidence there. Being, What's that? Jeff? No, I'm saying that's why I love doing this show, because I like I like being told I'm wrong. It's also why it's so important that we do the show live and we encourage our listeners to join live because then we get some awesome comments like that from Francois and Stuart, right? Because, you know, we're, we're putting on our tinfoil hats here and your, your opinions are just as valuable and we love including you in the conversation. I just want to share that right now because I know we have so many listeners that listen throughout the week, you know, while they're working out or, or while they're offline. But if you can make it Wednesday nights, 830 Eastern, everywhere that you can find anything on live stream youtube linkedin twitter twitch uh trovo i'm forgetting facebook i'm forgetting a few but (laughs) if you're there we're there guys i just want to i want to remind uh everyone also this live stream very generously sponsored by yougov um they're great supporters of the live stream they provide the absolute best data on gamers games esports fans around the world if you're looking for really actionable data on any of those audiences, and you're looking at the gaming audience as a potential opportunity for you, your business, um, you definitely need to be talking to the fine folks at YouGov. You can reach out to them directly, or you can reach out to any one of us, um, and we can connect you with them. I will post a link in the chat. It's yougov.com slash BOE. It's even simpler than it used to be. Uh, I don't know. I, I think there's some stuff up there now, but we're gonna. there's going to be more there. So keep visiting that link. Keep checking it. Um, as time goes on, because we're going to pr- try and put real value added stuff there for you guys, uh, yougov.com slash BOE, um, and make sure to go show yougov some love. Um, guys, you know what this, uh, this means, right? Cause I've got a few smaller stories here. I think we might have to do everyone's favorite new segment. What do you say? Yes. Lightning round. Lightning round. Oh, I was waiting. <laughs> All right, guys, for those unfamiliar, if you're new here, um, our lightning round, I give uh, all of us, actually, including myself, uh, 30 seconds to give your quick take on on a number of topics. We're going to go through these really quickly. Uh, We'll try and go in alternating order, guys. So Jimmy, then Jeff, and Jeff, then Jimmy, um, and I'll, 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 you know, finish every one. But let's start with... Uh, gaming desks. <laughs> okay, let's start with an easy one. Probably Jeff's favorite here. Uh, by the way, if you go over time, you're gonna hear this sound, uh, which means you are over your time. Um, all right, guys. Here's the first story. Bifrost gaming desk lets you build 
your dream battle station. Um, now, what it is basically, it's a pegboard uh, for those who, you know who have in your garages like pegboards for your tools. It's it's like a pegboard, but for all your gaming accessories and stuff to put behind your desk or it connects to the desk that they also sell. And you see you mount all your things here to it, including your Coke on the side here that mounts to the desk and all your plants and Nintendo and everything else, all your accessories. Uh, love, hate, think this is great. By the way, you can hide all your cables too. Uh, we haven't seen much innovation in gaming desks. We talk a lot about gaming chairs. Jimmy, you love the gaming, this gaming desk concept. Yeah, you know, I'm a fan of organization in general. I got some pretty gnarly OCD and, and I, my things have to be a certain way. Um, this kind of reminds me of the Ikea one, strangely enough. But uh, it, for anyone that's watching, it looks really cool. If you're listening, check them out. Um, I, I think it's hard to find or I would be hard to find someone that doesn't think this looks cool. But I would definitely use this. And, you know, especially if they send me one for free. Bye, Frost. <laughs> <laughs> Hook it up. Jeff? Uh, I, I like this a lot. I mean, I, it's good for accessorizing. I can accessorize all my pens, maybe hang them on the yeah. wall. I'd be very excited about <laughs> that. Pens. I'm just going to need to hire a task rabbit because I'm not very handy. So no way I can yeah. put that together myself. <laughs> um, but, you know, I like it. I like it a lot. Um, I think it's so cool, guys. Uh, desk innovation. We may have to get on board with desk reviews the same way we're the official ch gaming chair reviewer of esports. Um I think we need to get on board with some desk reviews if we start seeing some innovation there. Um, all right, let's get to a more serious one. This one's cool. Motorsport Games partners with Romain Grosjean to assist Ooh. in the development of R Factor 2 and esports events. Uh, joining as a technical advisor, Grosjean will help iterate R Factor 2 and the company's robust live esports events. This is really cool. Motorsport Games makes racing games, partnering with a real well, ex F1 driver at this point. Um, curious what you guys think but also why don't we see this more in like real sports games like other sports titles like they're they're other than the name you never hear about them partnering with like an actual athlete to make the game better um jeff start with you yeah i think it's a great this is a great example i mean motorsports is definitely one of the it's the esport that probably has the most crossover between the actual sport and the video game i think we've even done stories in the past where like motorsport athletes end up crossing over into the real thing, which I think is always pretty neat to see. So good on motorsports, obviously, you know, leaning into that. I think R Factor 2 is is a pretty impressive game, um, you know, in terms of simu simulation. It's, it's probably the best out there um, and definitely exciting to uh, to bring him on board. Jimmy? Yeah. Um, to your point, it's like, why isn't anyone else doing this? I, I, I've... I've said before, and I'm going to say again, is I think just the, the way the racing community has embraced esports is really how it should be done. You don't see a lot of other sports, other traditional meat sports that are really leaning into this movement, to this community, or to the technology and the overlapping that, that are, are readily available, as well as as the racing community has. So ha hats off to motorsport here. Um, you know, maybe they'll get Lewis Hamilton next year. <laughs> I just had to say that for Paul's benefit. It's F1. <laughs> is, this, is this working? Um... <laughs> oh, Lewis is the one with the bulldog, right? Yeah, he's the best. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> Order in the court! <laughs> um, I'm good on, on who they picked here. I think Romain is a, you know, uh, a great F1 driver. Uh, unfortunately, whose career ended, you know, not not in not the most great way in a you know very fiery crash, yeah. and uh, it's nice to see sort of a second life in esports for these guys, and uh, I think big pickup for motorsport, right? That's just a, totally. a really big name, really really big name. It's the equivalent of having you know like a uh, maybe like a Tom Brady, right? Like a, it's a really there's only twenty F one drivers in the world at any one time, so. You know, any of these guys are pretty big names, so big pickup. I like to see this. Hopefully, R Factor Two is even even better, right? The, the, this can only make the game better. So, very cool. Um, all right, guys, let's uh, let's talk about Amazon. I have two Amazon stories, so we're going to do these back to back here. Uh, the first one maybe less good news. The second one, I think, more good news. And the headline here: Amazon Game Studio head Frazzini 
steps down. So the head of Amazon Game Studio stepping down. He's leaving to focus on his family. Um, he said he supposedly he was there at the beginning of Amazon Games. He was involved with New World, Lost Ark. Obviously, there was a very nice letter saying they wish him all the best, thankful for his contributions, etc. Um, what do you guys think of this? Amazon Game Studio has had a checkered, call it history, right? Um, is this a bad sign? Do we buy that it's about family? Is it just burnt out after, you know, all the ups and downs of being at Amazon Game Studio? Um, curious what you make of this, Jimmy. Go ahead. Um, you know, I want to draw uh, everyone's attention to the Business of Esports episode with uh, Facebook Gaming's head of strategy and operations, John Pan. Before he was with Facebook, John was actually over at Amazon. And because of a lot of the red tape on the things that he was and wasn't able to say, uh, given his posting at Facebook, we actually talked a lot about his time with Amazon, about his time with Riot. And it, it was a really fun episode. I also teach with John at uh, University of California, Irvine in their esports tract, uh, episode 178. Sorry, Paul, I'm using all my time <laughs> here. Just got it. Um, <laughs> it's a dumpster fire, stay away. It's a dumpster fire, stay away. I'll be quick. There you go. <laughs> episode 178. Uh, sorry, I lost track. Of, of that was a great shout out for John Penn. But start my time over. I feel like I didn't. Do you got, I'm resetting the clock. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 believe, I believe this. You know, I think, you know, Mike Rizzi, I think he's been there for, for quite some time. And if I recall, he wasn't always in gaming. So he's had a pretty long and distinguished career at Amazon. I assume probably made a lot of money. So guys like that tend to tend to retire. Um, I do remember there was a bunch of uh, some negative articles kind of around maybe his leadership and maybe a lack of understanding of the gaming market prior to the last couple Amazon releases, which have obviously done a lot better. It's a big job in the industry. It'll be interesting to see who takes it. I mean, it's a huge opportunity. Andy Jassy, the current CEO, has said games are a priority. So this is going to be a big, high paying job for someone. Curious to see who takes the, the leap. Any any theories? Come how how did I get the bell? And this is like the longest <laughs> thing ever. I mean, look, I, got, you know, I, I caught myself. I'm not going to say the juice. You know, <laughs> legally I can't say the juice, but you know, their people they can call my people. You know, I'm um, happy at GMBL, but Amazon is uh, is Amazon. Yeah, I, I mean, I look. I hope. I wish them the best. Obviously, uh, hope it was a you know mutually uh agreed upon kind of departure um i just think because of how much new world failed with so much potential you know uh, i i think new leadership was needed right they, they had such they had a potential gold mine with new world and and i don't know how they messed that up i mean i do know how they messed that up but um so much potential there i think new blood will hopefully bring new ideas and new approaches and you know, Amazon has all the resources in the world to make great games. So hopefully they do. Um, second Amazon story, guys. This one, the headline here is Amazon launches AWS for games, dedicated products and services for the gaming industry. So AWS, Microsoft, and Google are all stepping up their pitches to game developers and publishers as the industry grows. Now Amazon's throwing their hat in the ring, obviously. They have a specific AWS product for the gaming industry like cloud gaming, obviously gaming workloads in the, in the cloud. And now I think what's interesting is when people talk about cloud gaming, it's more like about this, right? Not so much playing games in your browser, uh, a la Stadia. It's more like what is the infra cloud infrastructure for game developers and games? Um, you guys love this move from Amazon. You know, is this maybe bigger opportunity than their game studio? Uh, Jeff, start with you. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to juice on this one a little bit. To me, this is something that Amazon was already doing. I think like almost probably every single gaming studio uses AWS. Like I know Activision does. I think Take Two does. I would EA may use Google, but I'm not sure. Like uh, most companies use AWS. I think they just are seeing gaming as a big opportunity, and maybe they're putting a little more focus into marketing to gaming studios as maybe they're seeing a lot of the money flowing into kind of web three gaming and yada, yada, yada. But I would like to see the products behind this. To me, this strikes me, me as something where it, it's, it's words. Like they're just focusing on it from a sales perspective more. And I'm not sure there's actually product behind it. 
Jimmy. Like there is product behind it, but not. No, 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 no. You're, you're. Uh, again, I know you're. You're sleeping on the bell. I, this, this whole thing is a facade. It's a collusion. All right. Oh, not to... <laughs> um, so AWS was at GDC in San Francisco. It was really fun to meet with them, speak with them. Uh, hinting, of course, here that I believe we'll be having them on the show in the near future. So stay tuned for that. Um, I'm supportive of what they're doing, and I think that if you're going to create a cloud-based gaming solution, that it has to start with someone like AWS. Um, and they can't do much worse than Google, so the sky's the limit. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I mean, I don't know why, Jeff, you're fussed about, like, whether it's renaming an existing product or it's a brand new product sort of doesn't matter, right? It's just, it's smart marketing to to launch a specific product. Again, whether it's underlying something that's the same or it's something that they've totally new that they've invented, I suspect not. I think it's really just a rebrand of an existing product stack. Um, I still think it's smart, right? You have an industry that's growing, might as well sell them something and make them feel like they're buying something specific, especially if your competitor is offering something specific. Um, Hardware Barbecue says, I still feel cloud gaming has a long way to go, but we're getting close. I mean, definitely not Stadia cloud gaming, Hardware Barbecue. I, I hate to break that one to you. Uh, data center deployment for cloud gaming would be interesting to see how it grows. Um, again, when we talk about cloud gaming, I'm really talking about infrastructure for normal games, like like yeah. who's running the servers for Call of Duty, right? When I, I think this is the better definition of cloud gaming, not how can I play Call of Duty in my browser on my Chromebook. Um, that, that has failed and I think is dead and gone and no one should be talking about that anymore. Um, so uh, Hardware Works says, they better not delete my Mass Effect 3 game saves for the ME. I need those character developments. <laughs> Um, I can't, can't guarantee anything hard to barbecue. Um, all right. I just want to mention this one. I missed Tom says that desk is amazing. Only $500 could be worth it. Organization is important for 500 bucks. I agree. Totally worth it. I saw it on Amazon. Um, yeah, it was cool. All right, guys, let's move on to the next story. Um, we've got EA here in the news and we finally have confirmation or, or at least reported confirmation uh, that EA will reportedly move forward with plans to rebrand FIFA as EA Sports FC. So we have a name now, at least, right? We've been theorizing what the name's going to be. So it looks like FIFA's going away, and it's going to be EA Sports Football Club or EA Sports FC for short. Very quickly, Jimmy, you love the name or you don't? Name's fine. It's not going to do anything. I mean, whoever plays and loves FIFA will probably still call it FIFA, but will also continue to purchase EA FIFA club FC. So I think they're saving a ton of money, ton of headache and, you know, good for them. Jeff. Yeah, I totally agree with Jimmy. Um, I think most people will probably still call it FIFA. I think this is great and that it saves them. I feel like I remember something like two, something egregious, like $200 million a year. Um, or so I made that number up, but it was something, substantial so <laughs> yeah. it'll be interesting to see where they what they what they do with that money you know do they invest in other games like apex legends do they return the capital shareholders do they pay it to their ceo and a bonus who knows any of those are possible <laughs> <laughs> um hardware barbecue says i'm just and there's a word missing here hardware barbecue so i'm not sure are you mad are you sad are you happy I'm just the most they're important not, word. <laughs> it was the most important word in this sentence. I'm just they're not calling it soccer. So you either love or you hate that they're not calling it soccer. <laughs> um like pro evolution soccer. That, we're missing that word. Hard barbecue. We need that word. <laughs> um all right. Let's uh let's move on. Oh, glad. There you go. I'm glad they're not calling it soccer. I think they know their market is not primarily North America. So um, it, it, that makes total sense. Guys, this is the last last story in the lightning round I want to get to. And it's maybe the most silly, but I just love the headline. The headline here, after 22 years, esports giant Ninjas in Pajamas finally releases pajamas. <laughs> and so this is Swedish esports team. They've been around 22 years, uh, big Counter-Strike team, Stockholm-based. Uh, they've, they're obviously called ninjas in pajamas, but up until now they've not sold pajamas. Now for $110, you can get silk effect polyester. I don't know what silk effect polyester is. Just polyester, I think. Uh, <laughs> Two-piece outfit, 
uh, sporting subtle neon embroidery of NIP's logo. Um, and uh, it, there you go. I, I can't describe it better than that. Unfortunately, if you're listening to this, I don't know how to describe it other than their black, silky looking pajamas. Um, did they re- wait the right amount of time, guys, to come out with pajamas when you're called ninjas in pajamas? Or, or should they have waited a little bit longer? Jeff? I mean, if they were going to wait 22 years, they should have at least made it a quarter century. Like, <laughs> you know, let's do it on the right interval. But it is shocking that they never thought to do this in the past. And it's also shocking that they chose to do a $110 you yeah. know, silk effect polyester. Like they could, they could have done like a, a range. Like maybe people would want a little bit of a cheaper product, maybe something even more high end. But yeah. is this what a ripoff? Thinking? You're calling this a ripoff, Jimmy? Price is outrageous. Um, <laughs> also, like, yeah, how, how did you wait that long to do something so obvious? Uh, you're not building any more hype by the extra, you know, twenty years beyond year two when when, it, when this could have launched. Um, at least it's not a hoodie. I'll say that. At least it's not a hoodie. At this makes a little more sense. Stole my take. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to be right then. <laughs> um, no, it's it's one of those things. How much do you want to bet that we see literally every other esports team do a pajama now? Right? We're going to see 100 Thieves do a pajama. You're going to see FaZe do a pajama. You're going to see them all do pajamas now. Um because that's what happens. I think uh, they're they're leading the way. Wear with... pajamas. I mean, I sleep in the nude. <laughs> 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 cool. <They're> fake news. <laughs> <laughs> that was waiting for that one. Um, all right, guys. Um, that 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 ends this week's lightning round. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed that. Um, let me get get us back to our normal show. <laughs> Um, I just want to read Tom's comment. He says, the lightning round is the best part of the show. Great addition. Can I license that intro? Uh, Tom, for a fee, anything is possible. Uh, Hardware Barbecue says, still a better story than Half-Life 3 <laughs> rumors. Um, I I will. I don't think we'll be covering Half-Life 3 rumors anytime soon because Half-Life 3 is never coming out. Hardware Barbecue says, I'm happy Ninjas in Pajamas isn't getting into crypto and NFT yet. I mean, I feel like all the esports teams basically have to at some point um otherwise people start asking why they're not um but yeah that guys uh wraps up both the lightning round and this week's show um i hope everyone enjoyed that thank you all for coming jimmy jeff thank you guys thank you to everyone who participated tom hardware barbecue johan uh Stuart, francois all you guys matt adam all, everyone who came in participated really appreciate all you guys um make sure to join the discord it's uh, discord.gg slash meta tv um and make sure go follow us everywhere uh everywhere you find business of esports content tiktok instagram youtube linkedin uh go follow our youtube a lot of people i think not following our youtube yet make sure you go follow that and subscribe to the podcast business of esports meta business meta woman all the podcasts we put out every week business of esports guys is now putting out like almost four pieces of podcast content a week. So you get sometimes one or two podcast episodes, you get the weekly news show, you get office hours all from one convenient feed. I mean, it's like, it, it's a, it's a smorgasbord of, of business of esports content. Um, Tom says, always fun. Thank you, Tom. Hardware barbecue says, have a good evening. And uh, Francois says, great show as always. Thank you guys. Uh, don't forget the future is fun and, uh, we will see you guys next week.